Hi, welcome back to Christine's Home Affairs. We've got a quick project today and this one is a pattern that was given to me by Janet. She sent it to me quite a few months ago and we're going to be making a crochet needle pouch. It can also be used for artist pencils and just general pens and makeup brushes and things. So this is the one that Janet sent me some time back along with a whole lot of patterns and today we're going to do the tutorial for this crochet needle pouch. If you want to make this as a knitting needle pouch, just make it a little bit longer so that you can actually incorporate the needles. Now before we get started, I got some mail yesterday. So let's open that together. This is from Donna in Colorado in the USA. So I'm excited to see what this is. I've got to have a look before I read it, don't I? <laughs> oh, what a gorgeous bag. That is beautiful, Donna. Thank you. I noticed there's something inside here as well. That's very well made. I love it. And a tote. That's a great idea with the elastic on there. That's absolutely fantastic. It almost looks like a blouse too. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Donna. That is awesome. Now I need some glasses. Oh, what a beautiful little card. It's pretty. Hi, Christine. I really enjoy your videos. Also, I've tried a few of your tutorials, the market bag and line tote. I love that you upcycle fabrics. I have acquired quite a few fabric pieces and upholstery pieces. I like to rescue fabrics from thrift stores and sometimes I'll find remnants online. From your videos, I heard you had a surgery and are recovering. I wanted to send you a little note of cheer and I made something for you as well. I reviewed your market bag tutorial and made one that is similar from fabric and upholstery remnants. Colorado has gone bagless this year. I've been making grocery bags and giving them to family and friends. I made one for you. I hope you enjoy them and I hope you feel better soon. Your friend Donna from the US. Thank you so much, Donna. That is so thoughtful. I will use this bag. I've got a whole bunch of shopping bags that I have in the car and this one is going to be used just as much as all of the other ones. I love that you've put a pocket on the inside as well. That's going to be really handy. In fact, that might be my new go-to bag when I go shopping and have my purse in there. Thank you so much for the gifts and the card and you're going up on my wall of fame. <laughs> okay, let's get started and we will make that crash a needle pouch. I have a piece of ribbon that is about 25 inches long. We can cut this shorter if we need to later. So it's just a very narrow piece of ribbon. It's just scrap from my drawers. We need some binding strips. If you're using quilting cotton like I am here and you're cutting it off the bolt, You'll need enough binding strips to make up 70 inches in length and it's two and a half inches wide. We'll be joining this together. So that's our contrast binding color. For the front pocket, I have one piece each, 15 inches by five and a half inches, lining and the main. For the main part of the pouch, we have 15 inches by 10 for the main, 15 inches by 10 for the lining, and I've also fused a lightweight fusible pallon to the back of the lining fabric. So the fusible pallon I'm using or the wadding or batting is just a very lightweight pallon, just enough to give it a little bit of structure. And I've chosen to fuse this onto the lining piece rather than the main piece like we normally would because we're going to be sewing some channel lines for the pencils or crochet hooks. We want to have extra stability in this piece of fabric. Fuse your pallon onto the lining rather than the main. We'll set this all aside and we'll take our binding pieces. Place your binding piece right side up. Grab your next one and we'll place that right side down so that we can see the intersecting corners on either side here. And then I'm going to mark a line from one corner to the next. And this is our stitching line. By joining your binding strips on the diagonal rather than on the straight, 
you're going to distribute the bulk of the seams across a few inches of fabric. And if you're using offcuts like I am, just go to the other end and repeat until you've got enough fabric to make up that 70 inches. Once you've got enough fabric to make up the binding that you need, we're going to stitch straight onto that drawn line. Now it's just a very quick process to join these strips, backstitch at the beginning and the end. And if you have a few pieces to join at once, just chain stitch them together rather than cutting your thread each time. Before we trim the corners off our strips, I'm going to open the fabric out on the wrong side and just finger press that open whilst I've got all of that fabric there. Makes it a little bit easier to manipulate. If you have one of these handy roller gadgets, that'll help press it out as well. And now that we've flattened that seam, we can trim off all that excess. And you just want to trim that off to about a quarter of an inch. So that's nice and flat like that. And we've distributed the bulk of the binding strip across two and a half inches. This next step is better done with an iron. You want to fold the fabric in half lengthwise and press that all the way across. Just give yourself a nice crisp edge all the way. Now that we've pressed the binding strip in half, it's got a beautiful crisp edge. We can now apply this to any quilt. We can now cut off a 15 inch strip for the pocket piece. You just want to cut off enough to go across the length of the pocket piece. We'll set that one aside. We've got the lining piece and the main piece, and we're going to place some wrong sides together. So I've got the printed side up and the printed side down. Place those wrong side together, and then we can place our binding strip right along that edge. And we'll take this to the machine and we're going to sew all the way down there. Once we've done that, we're going to flip it over and press it away from the main fabric here, bring it around to the other side, and you'll have that folded edge, which will sit on the other side and then you'll go and top stitch all the way down. I'm going to use a quarter of an inch seam allowance, back stitch at the beginning and the end, so all the way down. Once you've finished that, push the fabric toward the raw edges and you can press that if you like. Turn the fabric over and bring that folded edge back around and over and then we're going to top stitch. Once you've folded the edges over and clipped that in place, you can see the back edge of the binding is overlapping by a couple of millimetres or less than one eighth of an inch. I'm going to go back to the front and sew right in the ditch along the edge of the fabric there and that will secure the bottom layer. You can sew this from the back, there's no problem there at all. With the binding attached now, that looks really nice. And you can see on the other side there, the stitching has just caught on the edge of the binding. Before we apply this to the main piece of fabric, we're going to draw some lines. We'll find the centre of our fabric, fold that in half. There is the centre of our fabric right there, and we're going to draw a line straight down. I'm going to line up the straight edge of my ruler with the straight edge of the fabric at the top there or the binding and it should be straight along the bottom and then I can mark my first straight line. From that line I'm going to come out and measure one inch and I'm going to continue to do that until I get to the end. At the end there's probably going to be about an inch and a half, remember we've got a quarter of an inch seam allowance, we don't want to mark our line all the way to the very edge. We'll also be trimming this back a little bit later. With this first line as a reference, I'll take the one inch line on my ruler, place that over the top, 
and I'll also make sure I line up this edge here just to make sure I keep drawing straight lines and I'll use that previous line as my next reference line and continue on all the way. Once I've done that side I'm going to flip the fabric around and repeat the same for the other side of the fabric. So there's going to be lots of one inch channels. So in this end section I've got almost one and a half inches of space there. I'm just going to leave that. Flip it around and starting from the centre I'll work my way out again and continue. Allowing a one inch gap between all of these lines means that you're going to be able to easily insert your crochet hook or even your pens and pencils. Makeup brushes of the more narrow kind will fit in there as well. Let's take the two larger pieces of fabric now. We'll set the printed one aside. And we have our lining piece that has the pallon already fused to that. Line up the raw edges at the bottom and along the side and we're going to pin this really well. We need to go and sew all of these channels down and if you don't pin it well your fabric's going to skew as you start stitching. I'm going to pin every channel in place along the bottom row and that'll just make sure that none of these lines shift as I'm sewing and along the top I'm going to do every second row. That should keep it all nice and secure. We're going to backstitch at the very top edge and sew all the way down. You don't even need to backstitch at the bottom. We're going to trim this up to size later and we'll also be putting a binding around here. So backstitching at the top is more important. Then you'll need to trim up your threads as well. The other thing I will do to help prevent everything from skewing is I'll start with the center row and then I'll do every second row as I come out then I'll come back and do the rows in between. Pretty simple, just a bunch of straight rows. I'll go as quickly as I can. So I've skipped a row and I'll continue to skip rows until I've done every alternate row. Then I'll come back and do the ones I've missed. I've done all of those alternate rows and it's back to the ones I've missed out on. When you've finished all of those channels, if you like, you can go and secure the end flaps as well. Okay, we have our channels in place and you can see you can easily fit a bi row in there. And now we're ready to put the rest of it together. Take your main outer piece, place that right side, wrong side up, lay the quilted piece over the top. And I just want to square this up so that it's nice and even all the way around because as you stitch your lines, you have a tendency to bring everything in. So we're just going to make sure all the layers are the same size and everything's nice and square. To do that, I'm going to use the binding line as my reference line. And I've got my right side facing down. All the fabric is lined up all the way around. And from the top edge of the binding, I've got five and a half inches. And there are some wispy uneven bits sticking out at the bottom. You may want to trim it down to five and a quarter inches. Just depends on what you've got happening at the bottom here. So it doesn't really matter what size you finish up with. But I can trim everything up nicely along the bottom, keeping in mind that I've still got a binding to go on. So my reference line is the very top edge of my binding and then I'm going to trim off the bottom. And then I'll turn this around to the opposite side. And because my rule is not wide enough, I'm going to use the top edge of my binding again for a reference line. And this time I've got four and a quarter inches to the top edge of my binding. You can see there's a little bit of extra fabric coming off there. Flip 
that around again and I'm again going to use the straight edge of my binding as well as the straight edges on the top and bottom as my reference lines and I'm going to trim off just the excess fabric on the side there so I've got a straight line across here a straight line across there and that's nice and straight at the top and I'll just trim off any excess there that I don't want and on the last side I'll do exactly the same So we've got everything nice and neat now and I'm going to pin all the layers together just to keep it in place whilst I put the binding on. Curved quilters pins are much easier for the job that way you don't prick yourself you can get the pins in and they don't distort the fabric because that curve helps the fabric sit a little bit flatter. Now that I've got everything pinned before I do the binding I just want to attach this little piece of ribbon so we'll turn it over to the outside. I'm going to fold it in half and I'll place this about three or four inches from the bottom edge. So I'll pop that in just there. I'm going to take that to the machine and just quickly go and stitch that down with a couple of stitches. Then it won't be in my way when I'm putting the binding on. Okay, the ribbon is attached. The reason I haven't put it directly in the center is because there's nothing much happening here as far as needles or pencils are concerned. If I have the ribbon down here, it's going to be easier for me to wrap up and secure whatever's in my holder. Now we need to attach the binding. I've done a couple of different binding techniques in my videos previously. So this one is going to be a different one again. Open out one end, take the corner and fold that down. And we'll just finger press that crease in place. Then we'll open that out and where that fold line is, I'm going to cut just to the right of it. I'm going to cut off just over a quarter of an inch. So you can see now I've got the diagonal line here. This was the fold that we had created and that's a hem allowance just on the inside there. So now I can fold this back in half and you can see the bulk there is distributed over a couple of inches there. And this is where we're going to tuck in the other end of our binding as we finish. This is a simple cheats way of doing bindings. Now we can take our holder and it doesn't matter where you start on here, but you're better off starting on a longer edge and I'm going to start at the bottom and I don't want to start too close to the top corner because when I come around the corner I want there to be plenty of fabric to be able to sit in here nice and neatly. I'm ready now to sew my binding in place and you can see I'm only sewing the top edge and I've still got the folded edge along here the raw edge is on the outside and I generally don't clip my bindings, I just place them down as I'm sewing. What we can do is with our quarter of an inch seam, keep on sewing until you get to within quarter of an inch of the end. So the end of my little quilt is here and a quarter of an inch is about there. So you're going to sew with your quarter of an inch seam allowance along here and then stop and backstitch and take the work off your machine. Once you get there, we'll pretend that's been sewn, you're going to take this binding strip and I'll show you again at the machine. We're going to take this binding strip, we're going to flip it over. So the side that you've just sewn, we're going to take this strip and flip it to the side that you've sewn and you get a nice 45 degree angle there and then you'll fold it down and line up that folded edge with that line you've just sewn and then you can continue on with your quarter of an inch seam until you get to the other end and then you're going to do exactly the same again so at each corner you're going to stop a quarter of an inch before the end you'll flip your fabric over bring it back down again and then continue to sew. That will give you really nice mitered corners when you we finish up the binding. 
as we're going past make sure the ribbon is just out of the way and you can pop a pin in place just to keep the ribbon tape out of the way there we'll start here go to the end back stitch and keep on going around to prevent the shifting of the fabric as you're sewing it's actually easier to use a walking foot now this machine doesn't come with a walking foot and I don't think it's even supposed to use a walking foot. <laughs> I don't think you can even buy walking feet for this particular machine. So I had a spare high shank walking foot at the shop and I thought I'd rig up something really agricultural. <laughs> what I've done is attached a walking foot to the needle bar on my machine and the needle bar screw isn't long enough for the walking foot to go up and down. So I've just twitched some wire around the bar to make it go up and down and then twitched it on the other side. I've had a little play. It's worked for the few stitches I've done. Let's see how it goes. If you don't have a walking foot, it's fine. You can use a regular sewing foot. So we're going to do a quarter of an inch seam and I'm starting right on the very edge of that first diagonal crease of fabric. And I will stop a quarter of an inch before the end of the fabric, do a back stitch. Now we'll take the tail of the binding strip Flip it back away from the main body of your quilt so that there's a nice 45 degree angle there and then I will flip that and fold it right on that line of the raw edge. You'll see a triangular flap here so it should be the same going down as it is going up and you get a nice 45 degree corner and you'll have really nice angles when you turn everything over later. Now we can just sew straight down to the other side and we'll repeat for all the corners. Double check that your ribbon is out of the way as well as you're coming past. Finished at that corner and then I will flip and fold again. I'm now coming up to where I've started and I'm going to just come off the machine now just to show you more easily what I'm going to do next. Okay so here is the beginning where we've started and we've got that diagonal fold there with the fabric folded underneath. We want to tuck this tail into this fabric here now. So I've left a couple of inches open just to show you what to do. We want this tail to overlap the ending here. So where I've made this mark here is where the fabric begins just on this side. We want to come just before that stitching line there. So I'm going to cut off a quarter of an inch before the intersection right here because that's our stitching line and tuck that in until it sits nice and flat. Now we can go back to the machine and continue to sew and finish that section up there. And then your binding will be nicely finished. Rather than taking you with me, I'll just quickly go and sew over this area. All right, there we have it. Our binding is completely finished and this is where it's tucked in just underneath. I've just stitched that part closed. Now we need to sew the other side in place. So you can press this or just push it out with your fingers. Fold the fabric over on the corners. Can you see that really nice mitered corner? And that's from doing the, that flip and fold technique. So we've got our corner here. It doesn't matter whether you hand stitch this or machine stitch this. You'll be sewing along in this direction here. You'll fold this side down and then fold the other side down until you get a really nice mitered corner. You want the mitered corner on the opposites on the other side of your quilt 
you'll come straight along there and straight around and you've got a nice diagonal fold in the corner there. Now you can take this to the machine and sew. We've got our previous stitching line here. You can fold this fabric over and sew very close to the edge of the fabric and stitch the entire binding in place. I prefer my quilt bindings to be done by hand. I think they give a much nicer finish. So I will go and get a needle and thread and I'll show you how we can do that. I'm only going to be using a single strand of thread and it's knotted on the end. To start sewing, I'll come up from the inside of that layer of fabric and then bring the needle up to the fold. That will tuck away any raw edges from the other side of the knot. And then where I've come up with my thread, this is going to be difficult to see, where I've come up with my thread, I'm going to be stitching directly underneath the binding. Then I'm going to come up probably a quarter of an inch away on the diagonal and I'm going to come up and just take a bite out of the very edge of the fabric on the binding. So this is where I've started and my needle is about a quarter of an inch away. And I'll repeat this all the way around so where the thread has come out the needle is going to go in underneath. It's going in on the main fabric, but it's going underneath the binding and it'll come up about a quarter of an inch away on the diagonal and just pick up on the folded edge and you'll continue that all the way around. By doing it this way, even if you have a piece of thread doesn't, that doesn't match your binding, you're not going to see the stitches. So we're going to sew behind the layer of the binding all the time. And you just come up on that fold of the binding. This is actually a very quick process too. You don't have to take small stitches. And when I come up to that corner, I'm going to spread that open and just stitch into that corner a couple of times. That will secure that, lay, that row in place. Then I'll bring my folded edge over and with my needle, I can manipulate the corner so that the edge of the fabric will meet really nicely. And then continue on. I am going to go take this to the lounge and have a nice cup of tea and maybe watch the midday movie. There we have the finished binding. And I'm going to show you the difference between a hand stitched binding and a machine sewn binding. So this one here has been machine sewn from the top as I showed you earlier. And then I've hand stitched the binding all the way around. And you can barely even notice the stitches on the inside there. And you've really got to look inside the uh, binding to, to notice them there anyway. That compared to this one I did some time back, which was the needle case pouch for sewing machine needles. This one was machine sewn on both sides. And it's really difficult to try and get your stitching nice and even. So this had been sewn on the other side and then machine sewn down close to the very edge there. Personally, I think that a hand sewn binding looks much nicer than a machine sewn binding, but it is up to yourself which technique you want to use. I'll often do a machine sewn binding to make things a lot quicker. Uh, it saves so much more time, but the hand sewn bindings do look much nicer. There we have it, a quick little crochet needle roll up pouch that you can make in under a couple of hours. It'll make a great little gift for somebody or even a storage pouch for yourself. Thanks Janet for sending this pattern to me. Uh, it, was a, it was a really fun one to make. 
I hope you've enjoyed this video and I shall catch you next time. Bye for now.